Item 2.3, course repeatability, Vice Chancellor Russell. Mm -hmm. Thank you, President Himmelstein and Board of Governors members. Um, this item is a second reading uh, following a first reading, the last Board of Governors meeting on the issue of repeatability. And I won't go into all the details. Um, I, I'll be, I would be past the point of paint drying, I think, um, <laughs> if I did that. But I will entertain any questions. We did have an a open comment period. Um, and you, you see the comments um, that came in and the proposed responses to those comments. So part of your motion today will be to accept those comments um, as well. Um, so if there are any questions. Member Bob. Hey, the uh, folks in my district came and asked to meet with me about this too. They're involved with the performing arts. Mm -hmm. And again, could you just walk me through how this would work for somebody who is involved in a perform like a musical ensemble that uh, would, would want to um, uh, be able to continue uh, to uh, perform as part of their uh, education okay. or debate or any of the other types of things. Right. And in the, those cases that you mentioned in the performing arts, um, the, the way the language reads is if a CSU or UC requires as a part of its curriculum that the courses be repeated, um, then a community college can use that documentation in their curriculum approval process to achieve the same thing to allow the courses to be repeated at the local level. Most often, those tend to be courses like music ensembles, choir, band, orchestra, um, those sorts of things where the music department requires as a part of being a music major, um, you have to be engaged in an ensemble every semester. Um, so we would allow those courses to be repeated. There, there would be no reason to have choir one, choir two, choir three with separate outlines. They could have one course that's repeated. We do put a limit of four on those uh, repeats uh, with the idea that uh, our degree programs are two-year programs. So theoretically, a student um, should be able to take a fall, spring, fall, spring process to achieve the requirements for their major um, and move on. We know that students many times take longer to do that, uh, but we felt like it was important to keep our intent of this of keeping them on task um, and not allowing endless repeatability. And that also then would limit the ability for fall, spring, summer, fall, spring, summer, though, too, because that would be six courses. Correct. And that I don't, I haven't done enough to see how many of our ensembles continue to meet or, right. or do over the summer. What, uh, what, and could you, uh, I said that there seemed to be significant local district flexibility in some of these. Could you talk about the, what kind of flexibility the local districts would have um, in setting some of these guidelines for repeatability? Right. <clears throat> One of the things um, that is very important to take into consideration uh, when you look at this whole package is the idea of also moving courses that are more avocational. Um, it, let's take, for instance, the ensembles, um, orchestra, band. One of the things that I've heard many years as an administrator over those areas, as a faculty member in those areas, um, is that um, more than having the majors involved with that, there many times is a community involvement in those uh, programs as well. To round out the orchestra, you may not have an oboist who's a music major for a semester, and so you need to bring someone in from the community to participate in the orchestra. Um, uh, and that may happen more than one time, so the repeatability <coughs> issue becomes important. Um, so what we are developing uh, uh, alongside this is a set of guidelines on how to offer community education courses um, that pair up with these kinds of courses to provide the options. We're not, we're not trying to take away this ability from the campuses. What we're trying to do is to figure out ways to show them how this can be accomplished. So for the majors who need the credit, um, we would provide them the courses that are repeatable. Uh, many of the students don't need the credit. The avocational oboist who's coming in to play for the orchestra doesn't necessarily need the credit, mm -hmm. but they do need to be 
covered by insurance, they need to be covered by the policies of the campus and those sorts of things. So they need to be registered in a sanctioned course. So we're, we're, we are working right now alongside these changes um, to bring in community education guidelines that will help them, help the campuses understand how they can put, uh, pair these things together uh, in an appropriate manner. Will that also go to the student who maybe might have gotten all the credits they need, but then it, some, it takes more than four class or two years sometimes for a student uh, that they could still be a student but taking a class on a community ed basis? Correct. Correct. They, w they wouldn't be receiving credit. Um, and then th there also is the audit option, right. which uh, some campuses have audits, some don't. Uh, but there is that option for students to get involved as well. So just last, how far along are you in developing those kind of recommended practices? We have a draft. I'm hoping to bring it to the Board of Governors at the next meeting. Okay, thank you. Member Belinsky. Just a question, two questions about both of those options. In terms of the community service, will there be any kind of vetting with districts so that districts can kind of give you some input as to current issues they're experiencing with the way the community service uh, courses are funded and how you go about calculating that just to get more input? Yeah, we are relying heavily on the support from ACE, which is the the system-wide organization okay. that deals with um, non-credit and continuing education okay. programs. Um, their executive board basically is the editing board for this document that we're developing. And in terms of the audit, has there been any consideration of trying to find a way to increase the audit fee? Uh, yes, we did talk about that. I talked with uh, Vice Chancellor Troy as the budget system went through uh, this time. It was w one of those things I, I think that um, uh, seemed to be a small detail at the point that they were scurrying around with all the budget language and so they promised us they would l we would look at it next time, if I get that correct. I think that'd be helpful. Right. Because particularly, because I've heard this at some meetings I've been at, like in the music, area. I mean, you're offering the class in a huge room many times, so you could have, you know, 140 people in a choir, uh, but it'd be more reasonable for a college to go searching for people if they could get more money for that, for the audit fee. Right. Right now, that is set in statute at $15 a unit, so yeah, um, we would hope to either <coughs> move it out of statute or provide it at some sort of flexible uh, rate, um, but that will take a little bit more um, right. work than uh, yeah, right. we could do at the t at the time. <coughs> okay. Any more comments? If not, I'll entertain a motion. <laughs> member Zumi. So moved. Second. Second by Member Berg. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed. <coughs> motion carries. Thank you, Vice Chancellor.